Welcome to Equal Entertainment. I'm Tracy E. Gilchrist, Vice President and Executive Producer of Entertainment for The Advocate. Leon Moriarty's best-selling novel, Apples Never Fall, is taking the screen. The limited series of the same name follows the Delaney's, a seemingly perfect family that has it all until one family member goes missing. When the Delaney matriarch Joy, played by Annette Benning, vanishes, her four children begin to question what really went on in their parents' marriage, behind closed doors. I chatted with the show's stars Allison Brie, Jake Lacey, Essie Randalls, and Connor Merrigan Turner, as well as creator Melanie Marnich, about this thrilling new series. Well, actually, I just want to start by saying congratulations on your new show, Apples Never Fall. And I want to talk a little bit about this idea of family secrets and the American nuclear family. And Allison, I'll go to you first and ask you what that was like to kind of excavate the story of the perfect family. It was a really fun journey. Um, this show is definitely about taking a look at this family who from the outside seems perfect. They're pillars of the community through their tennis club. And um, of course, as the show goes on, certain things come to light and, and through the trauma of their mother going missing, uh, everybody starts to reveal their deepest, darkest sec secrets and, and you start to see the cracks in this family. And it was fun. It was honestly, it was really nuanced work that we were doing, figuring out all the relationships within this family and the dynamics between every sibling and the siblings and their parents. And a lot of the, you know, we ha actually had some rehearsal time on this show, which can be rare. And I feel like a lot of the rehearsal time was spent just talking about the family dynamics and those relationships and where the alliances are. And we paid a lot of attention to that within all the scenes when dad says something, which siblings lock eyes, what does that mean to whom? And so it it was very detailed and intricate and, and fun to do that kind of work. Yeah, well, it it shows. I mean, it's, it's done so well. And uh, Essie, I want to talk to you a little bit about your character, Brooke, who she's in this perfect family and there are competitions among the children and the parents and expectations. And, uh, and she's queer and that is not a big deal. And that's, you know, rather... Uh, um, step forward. Uh, and would you talk a little bit about playing this character? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, that was something that attracted me to the part from the beginning is the fact that Brooke's queerness is just accepted and not even talked about because it's so normalized within this family and within this, um, within this community that they live in. And uh, like representation is so important to me as a queer person. It's so, so important to me in my work to represent um, my community and I just thought that the way that Melanie Marnich's writing um, really honored that story and honored Brooke's identity within the family was just incredible and so rare. Yeah yeah really well done and I wanted to ask you Allison a little bit about uh, without going too deep into it but the series also touches on uh, mental health uh, which is you know, something that is deeply important. And would you talk a bit about uh, being a part of a show that doesn't shy away from the issues around the mental health as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have a family history of, of mental illness and uh, that is a topic that feels very close to me and, and very important to me. And I, you know, I think the the crux of it and what the way we look at it in this show as well is is it comes down to loneliness, how isolating that can feel um, when you're going through something. If you don't feel like you have anyone you can talk to about that. Um, for my character in this show, she's felt like she's had to bury a lot of things from her past, a lot of things that she's gone through emotionally and physically. And um it becomes a very cathartic release when she feels like she can finally do that. And, and of course she does have an ally in her mother, Joy. So when Joy goes missing, she feels especially alone. And I think it's important to have those conversations and to show characters like that who are vulnerable in that way. Yeah, I think so as well. And then Essie, would you talk a little bit about, you know, in watching this, I have to say at the end of episode three, 
I actually, I actually was very surprised. I did a, uh, uh, like a total gasp, which I wasn't expecting out of myself. And I wonder, Essie, would you talk a little bit about what it was like to get the scripts and see the story unfold? I mean, imagine you probably read the book or, you know, as these mysteries uh, ar arose, what was that like for you? I mean, in my in my second callback, I received some um, some scenes that sort of gave away to me a few of the things that were going to occur in Brooke's storyline. So before I'd read all the scripts, I had an inkling about a few things that were going to happen. The audiences will have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought that Brooke's, the way that Brooke's arc, um, Brooke's arc in the book is equally uh, equally fantastic, but the way that her book arc is written in this show by Melanie Manich is just really incredibly layered and nuanced and I thought it was like a really amazing journey to get to go on as an actor especially for someone in their first tv role like wow. myself to get to play all of these different colors and all of these different emotions and um, it was just such a gift I think something great about this show is that it truly is an ensemble show and every character in the same way that the family uh, presents itself in a certain way I think when people start watching the show they will sort of see a recognizable archetype in every character and then as the show goes on everybody will surprise you mm -hmm. something happens in every character's storyline and arc that that takes their character in a slightly different direction yeah and I started to notice that yeah I, I can't wait to see how the rest of it unfolds well congratulations to both of you and especially to you Essie on your first major tv role with this cast with Allison that's incredible with me with you <laughs> no thank you so much thank you i feel very lucky allison and essie might have been surprised by their characters but connor merrigan turner told me that his character was relatable from the start some might even say it was like looking in a mirror i want to go to you first connor and just ask you i mean of course this was a book uh but this character on the page, what drew you to him and kind of jumped out at you when you first saw him? Oh, I've initially, uh, the, the description from uh, my first interaction with the story was through the book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was reading the pages. It was before the audition. And before any audition, you're like, well, how, how am I going to relate to this character? You know, as a newbie, there aren't many that come through. But when they do, you're like, all right, how, how can I be like this character or think like this character. And the first description when I was reading was like, he's covered in paint. He looks like he's look, he looks like a hobo. Uh, his mother thinks he looks disgusting or whatever because he doesn't shave his face or his hair's up in tufts. And I looked in the reflection. I was like, huh, I think I, I, think I have a shot. I was covered in paint. I looked homeless. So from there I was like, oh, I, I think I'm I'm a shoe -in. Oh yeah, I think I, I can I can I can dig this. <laughs> um and the, a lot of his you were typecast. <laughs> could, be, could be. I mean he's <laughs> yeah, could be. My mom hates my facial hair. <laughs> I mean <laughs> but you know, some of his sensitivities and the way he interacts with the with the women in his life, I, I think I can relate to that and relate to his brother and, and family members. I, you know, there's a, a lot I could find myself in, really. What do you think the allure of the family drama is? Because it's so longstanding. I mean, we never get tired of it. Uh, so I wonder if you might kind of touch on that. And then also what stood out to you about Troy? Well, I know what I respond to in stories, you know, which is like um, the movement from feeling alone to feeling like you're part of something. Mm -hmm. to feeling like you uh, have these parts that don't fit or that you can't seem to, I don't know, rectify the past with the present or who you thought you were going to be with who you actually are. And, and these stories that, uh, you know, tell these stories of like, having a little more compassion for each other a little more compassion for ourselves uh through looking at things directly or things coming out that um have been like tucked away that for me as a viewer as a reader uh is like affirming <laughs> you know to go like oh yeah man like keep on that path hmm. and so 
you know, no one's getting healed by watching TV. But like, there's a reason that stories have existed for as long as people have existed, because we want something to tie into from our experience to see and be seen, you know? And um, in this case, Troy has this narrative of uh, being a, a victim and having to chart this path to overcome that. And, um, and a lot of that is in his bond with their mother, with Joy. And so when Joy disappears, uh, unbeknownst to him, the ultimate stabilizing factor in his life has been ripped away. Um, and he, again, is kind of the last to know but uh, that's like the final thing he's got that seems yeah. stable. Right. Um, and ultimately that's true for all the siblings. And you watch as they kind of fall apart and also are forced to come together to try to find out what happened. And like that's continually at odds with one another. So I've never been through that personally. My mom didn't disappear and, you know, but like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> Um, but you know, I know what it's like to feel destabilized or to not be who you thought you were, or, or maybe that you're actually better than you tell yourself, you know, like just navigating that, I think is what I responded to in this and, and what I respond to in anything. I hope other people do. Coming up. And like you said, I think this is extremely common in so many women's experiences, uh, has spent a lifetime of sacrifice, be it for work, be it for her marriage, be it for her children. And then reaches a certain point in her life and says, okay, great, I'm going to retire. Welcome back to Equal Entertainment. Today, we're chatting about Peacock's attention-grabbing limited series, Apples Never Fall. And I have to note something that grabbed my attention, the show's portrayal of a queer character. Creator and showrunner Melanie Marnich told me why it was so important for her to showcase a queer character who is also so much more than her identity. I love that there's this family where there's competition among the kids and with the parents and this uh, kind of benchmark to succeed. And we have a major queer character, yep. and it's not a big deal, which yeah. is really refreshing. And right. you know, we don't always get to see that. Would you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I that's exactly how I feel. There's a queer character, and she's just the sibling, you know. And in it, it, and of course, she's uh, absolutely accepted by the family. She's has a partner. To me, it was just very um, real, authentic. Reflects my own extended family it reflects my own community it just is and it, as it should be as it should be um and so it was uh really fun to be able to to write that character to write her relationships uh and and that's it you know what I mean I, I, I I'm not downplaying it it just it's exactly what you said you know it's exactly what you said and representation is absolutely crucial yeah Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. And I want to talk a little bit about, well, I mean, the great Annette Benning is in this uh, series and she plays a mom who goes missing um, and a mom who feels underappreciated. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think that's a stand in for a lot of women's experiences. And yeah. would you touch on how that's woven into the story? Yeah, I, it's, it, you know, from the book and, and, you know, we, it was a, a obviously in a major uh, point of the show is a woman who, and like he said, I think this is extremely common in so many women's experiences, uh, has spent a lifetime of sacrifice, be it for work, be it for her marriage, be it for her children, and then reaches a certain point in her life and says, okay, great, I'm going to retire. I'm going to take it easy. And all those sacrifices are going to pay off. And then they don't. And she realizes that she actually is just taken for granted. And then sadly, she disappears, something horrible happens. And that's when her family finally sees her, you know, when they finally realize something and it's too late. And I think the show also speaks as the book did to, God, what's the phrase? The the mental load? Oh yeah, that's good. Right, you know, <laughs> that that moms and women's take, women's, moms and women <laughs> take on that, that goes unseen by everybody else. 
and yet they're, they're, the, the entire household, the emotional lives of their family members are on their shoulders. You can catch Apples Never Fall streaming on Peacock March 14th. You can watch the Advocate Channel live by downloading our app in the Apple or Google Play Store. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Advocate Channel, I'm Tracy E. Gilchrist, and thank you for watching.